Now we're going to look at uh, one of the uh, one of the religious systems that believes it has a message for all humankind. There are three such systems. One is the Christian faith, the other is Islam, uh, but we're going to look at uh, Buddhism now. Both Islam and the Christian faith are part of the Abrahamic faith systems. Uh, Buddhism is not part of the Abrahamic faith systems. It comes to us through the window of philosophy, not through the window of, uh, of uh, biblical theology. The founder of Buddhism, his name is Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. And uh, he was born in the borderlands between Nepal and, uh, and uh, India, about 500 BC, about the same time that uh, the prophet Isaiah was holding forth in the Old Testament. And um, he was a Kshatriya. He was a prince, a very wealthy prince, had a lovely wife and a child. And his father was determined, this is the legend about him, his father determined that, uh, that uh, his son will never be exposed to the reality of suffering. He wanted to protect him from all such awarenesses that people suffer. And according to the legends, there's a number of, leg number of legends about this, one day he is going down the street, and here he sees a, an old man. And he turns to his uh, chariot driver and says, what's that? And his chariot driver says, he's an old man. Oh, he says, you mean people get old? Yes, that's right. That they don't stay youthful forever? Oh, no, no, people get old. They get old. Oh, my, he was deeply shaken. And he went home and he stayed of great depression. He had seen an old man and an awareness that apparently he also would get old sometime. So sometime later, he is in his chariot going downtown and oh, he beholds a sick man. And he says to his charioteer, what's that? And the charioteer says, he's a sick man. Well, he says, what's a sick man? Well, a sick man is a man who's sick, he's not well, his health is gone. Oh, yo, yo, so you mean some people get sick sometimes? Absolutely, yes, sickness comes our way from time to time. He goes home to his wife and child and he is greatly distraught. He's seen an old man and now he's seen a sick man. <gasps> what is going on in our terribly mixed up world? And um, so some days later he is going downtown again. And this time, what do you think he sees? He saw a dead man. And he says to his charioteer, Oh, what is that? And his charioteer, the dead man's been taken to be buried. His charioteer says, He's a dead man. They're taking to him to bury him. What? You mean people die? Yes, people die. And they get buried in the ground? Yes. And then what happens? Well, their bodies rot in the ground. I mean, they, they, they dust to dust, you know? Oh, my, 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 my. He is greatly disturbed. And so he goes home and he gets into a state of great depression. His father arranged for dancing girls to come and, and make him happy, musical instruments, musicians, so forth, but he is in a state of incurable depression. And so uh, he decides to leave his family, doesn't tell anybody, doesn't tell anyone about this decision. But he leaves uh, secretly at night, uh, does not say goodbye to his lovely wife, does not say goodbye to his son, never saw them again. And he goes to find the answer to suffering, how to escape from suffering. That's his mission. That's his passion, how to escape from suffering. Um, this is called the Great Renunciation. The great renunciation, the leaving. He leaves his family to go and find the answer to the cause of suffering. And Buddhism has a strong emphasis, emphasis on that, that the quest for enlightenment should supersede your family responsibilities. You need to renounce your family responsibilities if you're really serious 
about being enlightened and learning the art of escaping from suffering, the great renunciation. It becomes an ideal within Buddhism. In fact, many years later, as Buddhism went through China, it was viewed as an anti-family movement because of its emphasis on the great renunciation, on leaving family to uh, seek for the truth of why we suffer. So he decided first to try the Hindu path for finding enlightenment. And the Hindu path, as we said earlier today, involves leaving family and home and becoming a sannyasi who wanders the foothills of the Himalayas, seeking to become enlightened, punishes the body. We didn't talk about this today, but some will even sleep on beds of nails, things like that, to punish the body and so that they can find enlightenment. This is the path of asceticism. He punished his body so severely and he, and he abandoned food so totally that when you would look at his tummy, you would actually see his backbone. He was so skinny as he was attempting to find the answer to the question, why suffering? And he got nowhere. All that asceticism took him nowhere. He was still on a quest after all those months, several years, of this kind of punishment of the body. So he abandoned Hindu asceticism. And instead of that, chose what he called the way of moderation, neither going to one side too far or to another side too far, but choosing the middle way, the way of moderation. And so he ate just enough to stay alive, but uh, ate adequately so he wasn't starving anymore, as was the case when he was practicing Hindu asceticism. Um, and then he goes and, he, uh, and he's still not finding the answer to the question, although he, prop although he commits himself to this way of moderation. He's still not getting any closer to the answer, why do we suffer? And so then he turns to the Hindu gods. Remember, the Hindus say there's hundreds of millions of gods, and so he had ample gods to choose from. And so he began to invest his energies in prayer to these gods, asking for help as he seeks to find the answer to why we suffer. But the gods were no help either. So he's a very discouraged man. Um, the gods don't help, asceticism doesn't help, moderation doesn't help. How can he find the answer to the question, why do we suffer? And then one day, he was sitting under a bow tree, meditating, reflecting, and suddenly he became enlightened. He saw the truth. The enlightened one is called an arahat, an arahat, one who knows the truth, who has received enlightenment. What was this truth that he found so suddenly bursting upon him with such power and conviction? Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TBS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tbsseminary.com.